Okay, so it is three o'clock, so we're going to get started. Um, this training is being recorded, um, so you can access that if you need to at a later time. Uh, so just take a moment and make sure that your name is displayed correctly on the Zoom screen, but you can also take a minute and drop your name and your position and district in the chat box just to let others know who else is here. Today, we're going to be talking about the written notice. And here is our team. Um, everybody's here today, I think. So I'm going to let them come on and introduce themselves. So we'll start with Colette. I could unmute myself. You think I'd be able to handle that by now? Hi, everyone. My name is Colette Sullivan. I am the federal programs coordinator with this exceptional team. Glad to see you all. All right. And Leora. Hi, everyone. I'm Leora Byrus. I joined the department uh, four and a half years ago. And prior to that, I was everything from an ed tech to a teacher in an SPPS. All right. Thank you. And Jennifer? Hello, I am Jennifer Gleason. I have been here with the team for almost two years now. It's going by quick. And like the rest of the team, I was special ed teacher before I joined. And Julie. Hi, I'm Julie Pelletier. Um, I've been with DOE for a little over six years, and I am the admin support for this. All right, thank you. And I am Carly Thibodeau. I am the newest member of the team. I joined in July, and before that, I was a teacher for 21 years. So thank you for joining us today. And this is our contact information. If you need to get in touch with any of us, we do our best to get back to you with about 24 to 48 hours. So we love to hear from people in the field, answer questions if they come up. Oh, and this is a new slide. Um, we are doing a newsletter from our team. Um, and so it will be coming out quarterly. And this is how you can sign up for that. If you would like to receive that newsletter, uh, you can use your mobile device and scan the QR code and it will bring you to the link where you just enter your email or you can use the link on your computer and enter your email. And oh, and the, uh, this is a link to the procedural manual um, Jennifer did drop that in the chat box, but this is embedded within the PowerPoint, so you have access to it. Um, and then a link to MUSER, the Maine Unified Special Ed Regulations. All right, so before we get into the written notice, we're actually going to start off by talking about the advanced written notice just pretty quickly. Um, so this is a table of contents from the procedural manual, which has all of those forms with instructions and directions, examples, um, to help you fill those forms out. So it's a great resource to use. And the advanced written notice has gone over starting on page three of that manual. And this advanced written notice is used to provide notice um, to the members that are going to be attending an upcoming IEP team meeting. The first part of that advanced written notice um, is really about documenting that child specific information. It's also about documenting the date, time, and location of the meeting. And then of course, the purpose of the meeting. Um, and you'll notice on under the directions uh, next to the advanced written notice, it talks about how it at least one box for the purpose must be checked off, um, but you can check off more than one box. So you can check off all those that are relevant for the IEP meeting that will be upcoming. All right, the next part of the advanced written notice is where you would list the participants that were invited to the IEP team meeting, um, including their name and their role. All right, and then this part is where you list your attempts to um, make reasonable efforts to schedule the IEP team meeting at a mutually agreed upon time and place um, for so that um, everyone knows that you've reached out to the parents and tried to do that. And if you were unable to get the parents um, at the meeting, this would this is where you would document those attempts to have them participate. All right. And then this one is if the IEP meeting is held seven days 
or within seven days of being given notice, the parents can sign this waiver saying it's okay to hold the meeting, even though they didn't have those seven days notice. And of course, enclosures, a section to know any enclosures. So the, any forms or documents that are sent home with that advanced written notice prior to the meeting. Um, for example, a lot of times procedural safeguards are included here in the enclosures, or if there are evaluation reports that are sent home prior to the meeting with the advanced written notice. All right, and so the purpose of the meeting on the advanced written notice should have alignment with the written notice that you'll be filling out later as part of the IEP meeting itself, um, because the advanced written notice clarifies why the team is meeting. And then um, when you meet, obviously, if you discuss other information, it's okay to check off additional purposes, but really they should be aligned to each other. All right, so just a quick check-in before we move on to the written notice itself, if there are any questions about the advanced written notice. There's nothing in the chat in the chat box. Okay, great. I didn't see anything either. Just making sure, giving people some time. All right, so let's talk about the written notice. All right, so um, this is from Muser. Uh, it's a part of Appendix 1 where the procedural safeguards are listed for the parents, and that's where um, all of the information about the written notice and the federal requirements, as long as the state requirements are. Um, and those procedural safeguards just list out what the written notice must include, all of those pieces that are on our main state form. Um, so the written notice is based on federal law from IDEA. Um, it And when you see you in the written notice, that refers to the parents uh, because they are, this is a document for the parents because it gives them a chance to review decisions that were made at the IEP team meeting before they're implemented in the IEP. Um, and this document um, is used by courts and hearing officers as a critical document that provides a written record of how and why decisions are made. So I think Jennifer is coming, is going to be presenting a new slideshow and I liked her phrase that she used. I should have stolen it for this one. I think it said, if it's not in the written notice, it didn't happen or something like that. So this is where you make sure you include all of those determinations and why that's happening, because the, this is an important document, especially if it's being brought to court. Um, all right, so the written notice, the, oh, we have the timeline, right? So it's in the federal regulations, it says that the written notice is provided to the parents in a reasonable time. However, MUSER, the main um, state regulations require that that's seven days prior to implementation or proposed or refused changes. So Maine has narrowed that down to seven days prior to any of those proposed or refused changes. All right, and the written notice is used to notify the parents um, at least seven days prior to those proposed or refused changes um, about these things like referral, evaluation, identification, programming, placement, um, the consent for initial placement of services, or any other things that apply to FAPE. All right, and then this is the procedural manual and you can find everything you need to know about the written notice on page 87. So a lot of the rest of the slideshow includes instructions and directions taken directly from the procedural manual because it, they're great resources and it gives you a lot of information about what to include in the, these documents. All right, so the written notice <clears throat> describes the team decisions, including those that were, pr were proposed or rejected and any data that supports those decisions. Um, and it's the district's offer of fate for the child. And you need to send a written notice after every IEP team meeting, or if there's been an agreement with the parent to amend the IEP without a meeting. 
or any other time that the SAU makes decisions that affect FAPE for a student. All right, the first section of the written notice, again, is that child-related information, everything to do with the child, and then um, dates again. So remember to date these. So date of team meeting is really important to have, especially when you're sending it home to parent to document that timeline and them having it seven days before the IEP is implemented. And also remember if you're amending to put that date in for the agreement of when it was amended. The purpose of the meeting on the written notice um, looks very similar to the advanced written notice and should, again, should align. So you can check one purpose or more if it's applicable. So for example, if you were doing an annual review for a child, you could check off annual review, but if you were also going over evaluations, you would check off that box also where it says evaluations and re-evaluations. And here are some examples of other, if you checked off the purpose of other, might be for manifestation determination or program review or parent request. Um, and it's also important to know if you're doing talking about post-secondary goals and transition services um, that you check off that post-secondary goals and transition services box when you talk about that transition plan at meetings. And then again, the procedural manual has directions and goes into much more detail about the purpose of the meeting. <clears throat> So section one is describing the actions regarding the referral, evaluation, identification, programming, or placement proposed or refused by the SAU. So this is really about the determinations of the IEP team, what it came down to and what was proposed or refused. And again, here are directions about things that may be included in this section. Um, and we're going to go into this a little bit more. So when you're listing those proposals or refusals in section one, you wanna list them separately and in specific terms. So I like to think of it as like an outline or a table of contents for your IEP, because all of these decisions that you're making at the IEP team meeting will be reflected in the IEP. And so you wanna make sure that you are making very clear statements about that. So, um, I think it's easiest if it's broken down either like if you number the determinations or if you give them letters or bullets, some way to kind of distinguish one from another instead of having a big paragraph where it's all put together. Um, and in this section one, you want to um, include what those determinations are and the date that they're going to start, but this is not where, where you put the why you're doing these things. That's going to come later in section two. So these are the determinations for the team. And some of those proposals or refusals of determination might include information about the referral of a child for special ed evaluation, where you talk about you want to move forward with a referral. And you list out those evaluations that will be completed. Or maybe you've come together and you've evaluations have been completed. So you're going over eligibility decisions and you're using an eligibility form to determine whether the student is eligible for services, and you would want to note that in section one. Um, this is also where you would talk about agreements reached with parents without a meeting, um, and then everything in this section is going to reflect those decisions around programming, those special ed and related services, the LRE, any goals that are developed, ESY, accommodations, whether you're adding or taking them away, um, you would also put in the transition planning that was discussed and what was decided by the team in this section. Um, and remember to be specific and outline those determinations because parents should be able to easily go to section one and find each determin determination that was made by the team. Um, because really this is a document for the parents. Uh, it should be easy for them to understand. Let's see what else. So, oh yeah, an important point is that determinations are made by consensus. And if the consensus is not reached, the SAU will make the final decision. So that should be noted in the written notice. 
Um, you don't need to put the purpose of the meeting because that was already put on that first page. And if you're, if the parents waive their right to that seven day notice, it needs to be stated in this section, um, but it needs to be the parent that waived their right and it is not a team decision. Now, this is more information about that um, parents waiving their seven days before the implementation of proposed or refused changes. So they have to have those seven days. And the reason that we say that is because if you have a meeting and the annual date is on 1623, it gives us time for mail. And so it can get to them hopefully by 1 9 of 23. And then they would have it in their hands for those seven days. And then that is when the duration of the IEP would start if they did not waive their seven days. However, they can waive their seven days. And if they do that, then the IEP can be implemented sooner. And that must be documented in the written notice, like I've already said, with a statement such as this one. <clears throat> However, there are two times when a parent or guardian cannot waive their seven day notice. Now, does anybody know that? Do you want to take a chance if you're willing to drop your ideas in the chat box? That would be great if you know of one or both of the times when a parent or guardian cannot waive their seven day notice. Excellent job. You guys got it. That initial referral or that initial IEP because they need to sign that written notice giving consent for initial placement and or if they did not attend the meeting, right? Because they're not there to waive their waive their rights to that seven day notice. Great, excellent. Thank you for being brave and putting your ideas on the chat box. All right, so here's another thing. So what if you hold the meeting, but the parent or guardian is not in attendance? Can you call them later and share with them the details of the meeting? So I won't put you on the spot to put things in the chat box about this unless you really want to. I'm just going to kind of skip to the next part. So you want to think about this when you're thinking you'll call and talk to the parent after the IEP meeting if they weren't able to attend. If you contact them after the meeting, you're getting input from them after the fact, and it would most likely change the outcome of the meeting. So then you would have to make an amendment to the IEP and complete a new written notice to capture those changes and amendments. So that is best to get their input before the IEP team meeting or have them try to participate in some other way. All right, moving on to section two. This is all about explaining why the SAU is proposing or refusing to take the above actions. So, and when they say the above actions, it's all that stuff that was determined and outlined in section one. So anything you put in section one, and this goes back to my idea of either numbering those determinations in section one or lettering them or bullet to put, making bullets, every number letter or bullet needs to have a corresponding one in section two, where you outline why the team determined to do those things. And I just said that, and so if, services aren't changing, you still need to record why that proposal or refusal was made. For example, if you're not changing services and they're continuing with the programming that they had from the previous year, you would just probably make a note that they were making great progress and so they want to continue with that current programming and kind of list out what that is. Um, because again, this should be written in a way that the parents can understand and it should be backed up with data also because you want to include that in your evidence. Why are they doing this? Oh, because they're making progress. See, they went from this percentage to this percentage and their um, reading accuracy, that's great. So we wanna continue with that. All right, moving on to section three. This is describe each evaluation procedure, assessment record or report the SAU used as a basis for the proposed or refused actions. So all of that data you referenced in section two about why 
the team made those determinations, <clears throat> you want to record that information here, that data assessment information, any information that team members are sharing about the progress of the child that affects their programming. You also want to document introductions of team members and confidentiality statement um, is recommended. And if you're doing going over evaluations, either for an initial evaluation or a reevaluation, you want to make sure that you include the names and dates of those evaluations um, that the IEP team discussed and considered as necessary for their programming and those subtests that were considered in the scores. All right, section four is um, where you describe any other options that the team, which includes the parent considered and the reasons why those options were rejected. So this is where you talk about um, that least restrictive environment, right? It's we discussed possibly doing this, but we decided to do this instead. Um, you could talk about, like I said before, the current program is working, so we are going to continue with those services. Um, there's no need to change anything right now. And you can go into more detail about what those services are. Um, you could also document here the discussion if you talked about more than one eligibility category, um, discuss why one was chosen. Let's say you decided that they were identified as um, SLD, and but they don't have um, an other health impairment if you were looking at those two separate categories. You could also document the need for extended school year services here and whether the data shows that they need those services or not, and um, even location, like if they're having their least restrictive environment, is that are those services going to be, are they best provided in the general education setting or the special education setting? All right, section five is describing any other factors that are relevant to the SAU's proposed or refused actions described above. So, oh, sorry, go back here. So in the directions, you can see that um, here you would list anything else that's a factor, such as medication, um, could be, you could talk about a change in residence, um, it could be about their attendance or any of the things listed here. But Obviously, it can be more than this list. This is not an exhaustive list of possible factors. All right, and section six is about uh, describing <clears throat> or a description of the points made by the parents, including the parents' description of their child's progress. And it also includes all of those words underneath that points by the parents. This is about um, the parents are provided uh, contact information about reaching people or agencies around their procedural safeguards and assistance with accessing those. So for the description of the points made by the parent, um, this is really about putting the parent concerns, but it's also about capturing any other um, points that they made during the IEP team meeting that are pertinent to the child's programming or their progress, because this is related to 3A on the IEP, but it should not be a copy and paste. Um, they can mirror each other, and you can pull out the concerns that were noted um, on the written notice and put them in that section 3A on the IEP, but they should not include every, all of the points that the parents made, just those concerns. And here's just to follow up about those procedural safeguards. Typically there's um, contact information in there with a phone number that the parent can contact the school district, usually the special ed director in that information besides those other um, contacts. And a reminder that no sections in the written notice can be left blank. If you have a spot where you have no information to put in there, just put in none at this time or not applicable. And on the members attended section, 
make sure to record all of the people that attended the meeting um, and the date of that meeting. And if there was no meeting, you still need to record the people that were informed of the decision and when they were informed. And this is the spot for those initial provision of services where that signature is needed from the parents. If it's the initial special education services being put into place. And again, enclosures, just like on the advanced written notice, the written notice has a spot for enclosures. So you can list anything that's sent home with the written notice, such as uh, the consent, a consent to evaluate, or procedural safeguards, or any of those eligibility forms that may have been filled out at the meeting. All right, so we're just gonna pause here, see if there's anything in the chat box, if there are any questions that have come up about the written notice or even the advanced written notice, if you thought of something. I don't see anything right this second, but I'll wait just a few more seconds. If you give procedural safeguards at a meeting instead of mailing with, should you add that to enclosures? You can add that to enclosures, but I would also make a statement in the written notice itself saying that you um, gave the procedural safeguards to the parents at the meeting. Even it, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't, team, what do you think? Like, should it be in enclosures also or just if they document it in number one that they gave them to the parents? For an annual, I, I think I, it's fine, yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. All right. So we're going to move on. We just have a few more things. Okay. So we're going to talk about um, the Andrew F. case. Um, that was the Supreme Court ruling in Andrew F. Um, where they sided with the parents that they were not providing challenging goals for the student. Um, and this court case highlighted the fact that the IEP team must discuss and develop IEP goals for students that are appropriately ambitious and that a school must offer an IEP that's reasonably calculated to enable a child to make progress appropriate in light of the child's circumstances. All right, so it's important to remember based on this court case that the child that the team demonstrates the following indicators of progress. And this relates to the written notice because this is where you're talking about that data about the child for those annual reviews or that initial placement into special education. And so if you if the child isn't making progress, you wanna note that and use data to back up um, those decisions that are being made at the IEP team meeting. So from this court case, they're saying that the IEP teams must demonstrate the following indicators of progress. Um, that the child is receiving all special ed, supplementary aids and related services outlined in the IEP, that the IEP team is making appropriate modifications and appropriate accommodations are provided, um, that school personnel receive the supports and professional development they need, and measurable IEP goals enable a clear assessment of whether the child is making adequate progress. So those are the important things to remember from that. Andrew F. case that IEP teams really should be considering when they're meeting. And other important things that came out of case law, some mistakes that were being made was that the written notice failed to document the team discussion about the child's current lack of progress. Either there was no data or the discussion didn't happen or it happened, but it wasn't documented in the written notice. So everything that you talk about as a team and make decisions around should be documented in that written notice as clearly as possible. Um, the lack of progress discussion should be should prompt the IEP team to look at goals and accommodations and services, um, look at what's working, what's not working, what needs to change in programming based on that data. 
Um, and then those discussions and changes should be documented in the written notice in detail. Some other common mistakes were regarding the least restrictive environment. And so their written notice indicated a change of that LRE without indication of the parent's disagreement or agreement to the changes. Um, and it, the LRE also happened without that seven day notice. And the district needs to indicate in the written notice the disagreement and or agreement discussion and why the IEP team made those changes to LRE. All right, so some commonly asked questions. Do the words least restrictive environment need to appear in the written notice? And that's a no. We don't look for those words specifically. They don't need to be there. But if your director wants you to use those words, then by all means use those words. We just look for documentation that that least restrictive environment was discussed and um, needs for programming in that location. <clears throat> and I'm not sure if this question is still applicable, but I just left it in here. Where should the conversation of COVID-19 be documented in the written notice? And um, you can put it pretty much in any of the sections three, four, or five, um, or, and if the parents bring it up, you can put it in section six where the parents list their concerns. And what if the parent waives their right to seven day notice? And we've gone over that a couple of times. You just need to document that in the written notice by saying that the parent waived their right um, and the IEP can start the next day. All right, any other questions? I'm looking at the chat box and I don't see anything. Can I ask a question without having to type it out? Yes. <laughs> Hi, what is the Hi. best practice? This is Lena Vitaliano from Eva, how are you? Um, I'm good, what is the best, Good, thanks. What's the best practice when, obviously the person who's writing the written notice is doing their best effort to record information as it's presented, right? Um, and that the written notice is not a transcript of the entire discussions that are happening, but just the points. What if a parent um, upon receiving the written notice is in disagreement with what was written under the parent concern section? Um, what's the best practice to, to deal with that? Hmm. That is a very good question. And Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so they're in disagreement with what the person writing the written notice captured as, yeah, okay. For, and they don't agree with how they wrote it of what they said. All right, Correct. so I'm going to say that I think if they disagree vividly, then I would make an amendment or not an amendment to the written notice, but write an additional written notice, just stating that the parent um, had concerns about what they had said in section six and write what they want in there, if that makes sense. It does make sense. And, and in my particular case, I did that. I even offered the parent to send me an email drafting, mm -hmm. you know, the wording that she wanted, which of course ended up being a dissertation. So I took that and tried to pare it down a little bit and still disagreed with me. So would it be inappropriate to attach the email? Just say, see attached email of parent concerns? Um, I don't think it would be inappropriate. I would just make what you had and then maybe attach the email and you can add right. it as an enclosure. Does anybody else okay. want to chime in on this from the team? About no, I, I think that what you said, Carly, makes sense. I think amending the parent concerns in the IEP, if they don't, um, agree with what was captured um, and creating a new written notice to explain that. Um, yeah, and the email piece, I, I guess I would want to get a little bit more guidance about that, but I, I don't think that it would be wrong to attach it to the written notice. Just remembering that the legal note, that the written notice is a legal document, so it, it could end up, you know, being seen by other people depending on, you know, if the parent had due process or something like that. And then knowing that this is, uh, you know, a, a, a potential issue, make, you know, your next meeting, I would probably uh, have a conversation with the parent before I ended the meeting 
Mm -hmm. Just, you know, this is what I've documented. Do you want to add anything, you know, just to try to alleviate that moving forward? Colette, thank you for that. That's exactly what we did. So at our next meeting, we tried to draft the language immediately. And of course, we're yeah. virtual. So I had her seeing it. And yeah. interesting. And she, at the time, agreed. And we wrote in the written notice, parent agreed with blah, blah, blah. When the written notice was sent home, there you she, go. Still sent, she still sent an email back saying, oh, that's not what I remember it was written. I mean, so it's a constant battle with this particular parent, but I just want to make sure that we're, you know, we're doing our due diligence to be smart about it, right? Because I don't think there's any winning in this particular case. So we just want to just be smart. So I just wanted to get your feedback on that. So thank you. I like what you said, Lena, about um, that you documented in the written notice that the parent agreed. I think that's really smart. But I also think what Leora suggested about really get, you know, we would need to get some guidance about attaching the email. So let us mm -hmm. do that and we'll get back to you just to be really clear. Awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah, you got it. All right. Great question. Yeah, good question. I mean, we're always learning too. So this is this is good. Yes. All right. Next is just our uh, written notice fun fact. It's a one pager about the written notice, according to Muser. Um, I've also included some templates and exemplars <clears throat> of each section of the written notice. I'm not going to go through each of these. These are just for you to use if you'd like them, um, because people are always asking for examples. And just a little reminder that they're only examples of what could be in each section. So I'm just going to kind of go through these pretty and quick. Can can I jump in? Because I have Absolutely. to jump in because this is my, you know, my my uh, my job and my role and, you know, blah, blah, blah. You guys know this, right? So so um, templates and exemplars were pulled, right? We stopped using them before I took over this position because what we what what they were finding was that people certainly not anybody on this call, right? but people were taking the examples that were being shared and they were plugging them right into IEP. So um, teams were finding that the examples that were being shared, they were going on site and they were seeing word for word on IEPs on site. So please, like Carly said, these are just examples. These are not intended to be used on your plans, but you guys have been asking us for exemplars. And we really wanna honor that. So just keep that in mind. No way, not us. That's right, Lena, I believe it. Thank you. <laughs> Yep. So you'll see each one is labeled. It tells you which section it is and whether it's the template or the exemplar. So even just a template to kind of think about, um, like I said before, that section one, I really like to think about, about that section is like the outline or table of contents for the IEP being developed by the team. Um, and so I just included some information there. Um, and then example based on the family of Mr. Exemplar and Ms. True and their child Joe exemplar. So you'll see those names throughout the examples. And I stole these from a previous written notice um, PowerPoint, so I can't take credit for all of this. Uh, and then this is section two template of what could potentially go and how you could set up that section and the examples. And same for section three and four, five, and six kind of put together because those are a bit shorter. And then we are at our professional learning feedback and contact our form. So if you would help us out by giving us some feedback about our professional development, that would be great. I am going to try to multitask and pull up my um, link at the same time, which I'm not so great at this. But uh, And so if you can fill out the feedback. We really appreciate it because we do use it. I have the link, Carly. I can throw it in there. Oh, thank you very much. You can then tell Randy my Lee, multitasking is not great. And Randy Lee missed the QR code and the link at the beginning oh. of the meeting for the newsletter too. Oh, the newsletter. Okay. We'll put that back up as well. Yep. We can do that. Do you have that one, Jennifer, or do you want me to find that? I think she's I can find it. Okay. All right. So yeah. So if you can give us some feedback, that would be great. And then when you're asked to select the training that you attended, it's today's date, 3-8-23, written notice. 
and um, you will get your contact hour certificate, a copy of this PowerPoint, Muser, the procedural manual, our office hours, and the IEP quick reference document. Um, be careful when you're entering your email address to make sure that it gets to you. So just spell that correctly. Be careful of that. And that. And I, we look at your feedback. I am in that feedback document all the time. We really, really use it. So for those of you who attend our office hours and give us feedback, give us specific feedback, thank you so much because we really use it. It's great. Sorry, Carly, I lied. I can't find it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to find it real fast. Let me see. Here we go. And right there. Okay. And I have a quick question for those of you who are on, completely unrelated. The IEP quick reference document, there's quite a few of you on here who have been on here with us several times. Are you using the IEP quick reference document? And if so, if there are, um, we're, we're looking to tweak it. We're trying to figure out if it's working for people, if it's not working for people, how can we change it? Um, we're just, we're just, we're not getting a lot of feedback on that. So if, when you, when it's, if you're not using it, when it gets sent to you in your email, take a look at it. And if you have feedback for that as well, let us know. Great. All right. So I did find the newsletter link. So it is there in chat along with the feedback and contact hour. And these are our resources, links to our resources. We've got a link to the professional development calendar um, and previous recordings and PowerPoints, and then other resources like laws and regulations and forms and reporting. Um, and that is it for today for the written notice office hours. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we appreciate all of you. And I'm going to stop sharing.